You are now listening to Scheduling Fate, hosted by author and counseling astrologer, Jamie McGee. For more information, please go to schedulingfate.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Scheduling Fate. Now, this is a very special episode with two of my favorite astrologers on the planet, and we are going to be talking about this year's eclipses, which I think you're probably starting to already feel if you've worked with me. We've definitely talked about the eclipses that are coming up. Before we dive into everything you need to know about these eclipses, I want to introduce these two beautiful women. So first we have Kathy Beal with us. Kathy Beal is a professional astrologer, psychic, and tarot advisor who helps individuals and business owners make decisions and better understand and laugh about themselves and their options and the people in their lives. You can learn more about her at empowermentunlimited.net. Yeah. I'll make sure you have the link for that underneath this too, because I love listening to Kathy every week. We also have a master astrologer, Donna Woodwell, here with us. Donna is an astrologer, a magician, and a master teacher and author. She is the headmistress of her very own magic school. Donna has always led an enchanted life and enjoys helping others do the same. Welcome, everyone. All right, so the eclipses of 2024. If you had a keyword to describe these two seasons, what would be your keyword? Motivating. Motivating? I would have said feisty. 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 Feisty and motivating. Yes. If you're being motivated, you have to be feisty. I love that. All right. So we are really close to the eclipse season now. If you had any best practices to prepare for this eclipse season, what's, what are some key tips? Start doing this now. You should have started this in That's January. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like organize. Get your surroundings and your environment and your schedule as cleaned up as you can now and notice what direction you're facing because the starting gun is going to go off and you're going to react and you want to be sure you're heading in a direction that you want and that you're not tripping on the stuff all over your floor and your table and your desk yeah i, like I said this, i said exactly the same thing you know you would have started doing this when mars was retrograde at the end of last year this is part of a sequence of what's happening this year to get everybody ready for the real change that's coming next year so this is just another kick in the backside to get you in a place where you're willing to take the leap to manifest what you've always wanted to do for yourself, but maybe have been hesitating to do it. Oh, I like that. Yes, definitely. The listeners of this show know that I am all about like, take care of yourself in the short term, but definitely look at the long term. whatever you can do now to get out of your way in the future and be clear about what you want to manifest will always serve you best. So the Eclipses always have a bit of a history with them. They have a story. Like we've seen these archetypes somewhere in the past. And sometimes that can help us understand what's coming in already. Would either of you like to talk about how this eclipse energy that we're stepping into now? Because we have an Aries eclipse in the spring, and then we have a Libra eclipse. And in the fall, we're going to have a Libra eclipse and a Pisces eclipse. So the, the cycles that we're in, the archetypes, who would like to dive into that? Just waving it around. Okay, so... If you are someone who's totally new to this concept of eclipses, and if you're listening to Jamie, then you'll love astrology. So there's different ways that astrologers categorize eclipses, that we decide what they mean. We look at things like what family that they're in. Eclipses repeat every 18 years or so. And so they're all linked to this families that develop, they they are born, they, they mature, and then they fade away over you know, a 2000 plus year period. Um, so we looked at when they start, we look at some of the other ones in the sequence that have similar characteristics to get a flavor for how they're playing out over time. We also look at whether they're happening near the North node of the moon, which tends to bring new things in or the South node of the moon, which tends to help us release things, um, and move away from them. Um, we look at all kinds of things like their, um, their speed, their duration. We look at things like where they're occurring on earth. We look at the other planets that are near them. We look at what the ruling planet of the actual eclipse is doing. So, so it's kind of like looking at a super turbocharged new and full moon with a lot of historical baggage with it that help us determine what it might feel like for the world, but also for any individual. That's a great overview. Yeah, I like it. I have lots more. These eclipses are on the relationship axis, the axis of Aries and Libra, which is the the ten, tenuous balance of being yourself and being in a relationship with somebody else. 
I, you, I, us, me, 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 out of my way, whatever. And this particular, this particular grouping this time around is mostly solar eclipses, which are very forward ho, adding to the out of my way. And the balance is falling pretty much on the side of the individual in this particular time around, which started in March of 2023 and goes until March of 2025. So let me give you some times that a number of you have already lived through with eclipses in this particular vein. And, and I think you'll start to pick up some stuff in your own life and you will quickly see that some incredibly turbulent cauldron of change times in history in our own lifetimes, at least for many of us, uh, have been associated with this. And let's, here we go. April 2004 to March 2006. April 1986 to October 1987. April 1977 to October 1978. And here's the ding, 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 ding. October 1967 to September 1969. That one should jump out because it coincides with the summer of 1968, which is extraordinarily volatile culturally in the United States. And this also coincides with Woodstock, which I think is an unprecedented, peaceful gathering of masses, but some things that have happened, and, and Donna, you also said that this goes, I didn't take any back any further, but you said this also coincides with Queen Elizabeth II taking the yeah, throne. In the Sarah series is 1952, and so Queen Elizabeth, her father died, so she ascended to the throne, and the other thing that, the major thing that happened was the United States exploded the first thermonuclear bomb, so we'd invented the H-bombs the same year. And that fits. And was expanding, and there's all kinds of stuff going on in that region, too. Well, this coincides with Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie, which launched a whole go, let's be rebels and go through space, the launch of YouTube, the launch of Twitter, such as it was, the Chernobyl explosion happened during this, a lot of things having to do with affirmative action being created and then being scaled back in the United mm -hmm. States. First woman, Army appointed the first woman to star rank of brigadier general. First woman priest was allowed in Westminster Abbey. First woman to sail alone around the world. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter entered orbit around Mars. That's kind of beautiful. Eris, the asteroid Eris, named for the warrior goddess of discord, was discovered in 2004. And the other thing that probably you ought to watch is that the first divorced royals were married, and that would have been, at the time, Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. Oh, my gosh. And you know what's interesting is we're already started seeing some of these topics in the news right now. Like, there's even a Chernobyl show that's on Netflix. It's interesting how, like, the, it just automatically comes up. Like, we can notice these trends and remember what we lived through during those periods of time, but culture brings it back up and some of these points and i also see star wars and the aliens everywhere like it was all over the super bowl it was all over every little commercial on hulu it's even over on that apartments.com like the aliens are coming let's get them an yes. apartment a lot of these things you spoke to affirmative action so those do would you consider some of these themes more so stimulated by the aries eclipse that we're going to have here in the spring well the the scaling it back i would say has a lot to do with the Aries end of things. The yeah. Libra end of it would make sense. Like we should take all kinds of things into consideration. And then, yeah. no, no, the individual is more important. But I want to throw something else in. I just noticed in my notes that fits with things that both of you have said. The European, European Union expanded to 10 members. So who knows what will happen at this point. North Korea announced it had nuclear weapons. And the UN General Assembly approved a nuclear non-proliferation treaty in 1968. And I personally know somebody who's working on getting that thing. Wow. Uh, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his 40th birthday. How's that? It sounds He's a like Libra. Big surprise. Anyway, if, I diverge. I diverge. If you take it all the way back, you know, the 
the Saros series for this Aries eclipse started in 1501. So in the early 1500s, that's when Galileo was sitting out there with his telescope looking at the moons of Jupiter, realizing, hey, hey, there's other things out there. The Earth isn't the center of the universe and basically broke our entire model of of understanding the cosmos. We went from an Earth-centric model to a heliocentric model, you know, from those experiments that were done around that time. So, you know, put that into context. It's also a special series because it tends to happen around supermoons. And supermoons are just when the moon is full near the closest place in its orbit to Earth. And because it's a supermoon, it's covering up more of the disk of the sun, which means they tend to be longer solar eclipses than usual. So the maximum of this eclipse is like four and a half minutes, which is actually pretty substantial. But a couple hundred years from now, when we get to the true maximum of the whole series, it will be a seven and a half minute totality period. That's that's as long as you can possibly be. People have gone back in their records like 4,000 years in each direction and they can't find anything longer. So wow. it's it's got a lot of, oomph behind it. And then this one in particular happens to coincide near the solar maximum. You know, the sun has 11 year cycles of its own and a solar maximum just means it's fiery Corona is extra active. There's magnetic forces flinging around. So during that totality, the halo around the sun is going to be far wider than it usually is in total solar eclipses. So it's like the sun is refusing to be completely eclipsed. I'm going to shine to watch me burn. And so put that into the context of all of the other planets are also going to be visible at the time of the total eclipse. When the, when the, when the moon passes directly in front of the sun, it's, it's dim enough so that you can see some of the brightest stars come out in the sky. So we'll be able to see um, Mars and Saturn over toward the west of the sun, closer to the horizon, conjunct in Pisces, we will be able to see the sun bracketed by Mercury on the left, upper left, Venus on the lower right, and we will be able to see Jupiter and Taurus over to a little farther to the left of the sun. So everybody's in the show. That's an awful lot of celestial energy happening all at once. So if we, and it's in the sign of Aries, which in addition to it being all about, you know, me and us relationships, astrologers call that the world axis. That's the, the energy where stuff comes into our planet and affects everyone and affects change. So it's a pivotal point for, you know, hey, we need to go in a new direction. You know, I, I worked for an astrologer once who used to say eclipses are, are the universe's sign that you're going to walk across the bridge and then burn it behind you so you can't go back. So that there's something like that moving forward that we are, that we are, I mean, eclipses, eclipses line up with large evolutionary cycles. So there's something about the need to make a change that we do not fall, like we don't regress into something else. We don't, we don't fall back on our wayward ways. We like go forward and it stays. And so given everything that's happening in the world right now, I think that we are, we can't be surprised by some major shifts or at least preparation for the really major shifts that are coming up next year. So just for the date, if everyone's listening, you're like, oh my gosh, when is this happening? What should be prepared for? The Aries eclipse is on April 8th at 19 degrees Aries. The Libra eclipse is March 25th, five degrees Libra, which we're about to approach that one as you're listening to this podcast. I, I like how you're talking about how it's preparing for something and burning the bridge behind us, because I think that's the biggest struggle with these seasons, especially when it comes from me and we, and where it falls in your chart is you may be tempted to hold on to what was instead of anticipating what will be, or to kind of see the rhythms of, of how this has happened somewhere in your life. Now we stretched all the way back to when this began, but, and depending on where you were, I even just ate. 18 years ago, like what were some of the big significations in your life? What did, what left and what came in and, and how can you approach that in a different way or some things that, 
I know you've heard me talk about on this podcast, but again, this just kind of like glaze into that. The message is that this is a gift. It doesn't feel like it in the moment at times because we, we're we you're born at this time for a reason and you're getting ready to change and move into a new chapter, which could be one of the most challenging things that you could ever have to do, especially when it has to do with relationships. I know we've already kind of touched on best practices, but what are some of the things that you would see impacting personal relationships? All right. Lunar eclipses, the one that's coming up at the end of March. Lunar eclipses always bring really big revelations. So you may find out some things that will make it easy for you to say, well, end in this chapter, oh, going out the door, lunar eclipses. So big revelations, there are big chapter endings that happen. I, I like to look at it as like the, uh, on a stage, unseen hands are moving things around and then you come back in for the next act and things are different. Maybe it's not all the same people there. Maybe you've left, but I will say that some of the revelations could help you, could change your involvement with certain situations. You could learn things that are life-changing for you. On a solar eclipse, even though it's forward-oriented, Often things leave, something leaves because the sky goes dark and something isn't there. I like to equate this with a new operating system being installed on a computer and a device. It doesn't always happen when you want it to. Sometimes you're doing something and, oh my God, it goes down. And when it happens, you can't do anything while the system is is doing its little work and things are happening outside your field of vision and things go dark for a period of time. And when it comes back up, at least in theory, there's an upgrade. And probably something isn't there that was there before. Maybe it's your attitude about something. Maybe it's the set of ground rules. Okay, it isn't necessarily that relationships are blowing up here, but the agreements that we have are going to be updated to match who we are now and what's appropriate for our lives now. Donna, how would you like to add to that? I was just, I was just thinking about the AT&T outage a couple of days ago. And yeah. <laughs> our upgrades are breaking. I think for most people, you see the events, the effects of eclipses out there in the world more than you do your personal life, because I really do think you need to have planets close to those eclipse points mm-hmm. for it to truly manifest. Because like some people, I, I've had clients, including me, I've had I've had eclipses on my birthday and nothing happened. So um, yeah. it's not something to be afraid of. You have to have some other things lined up for stuff to manifest. But if you do have planets in Libra and Aries. These are pivotal years for change. You may know that from astrologers, from the fact that the the North and South modes are moving through those signs. That's what marks where the eclipses are going to be. So there is a, there is a, a change going on already as think as the, the celestial <laughs> clock moves around. But if you don't have those in your own chart, you might have them in the charts of the people around you. And so you may want to give them a little extra space to do, you know, whatever work that comes up, especially if they happen to have the sun or the moon there or the angles of a chart there. So the midheaven or what's rising on the horizon, the ascendant, because it's pretty classic to have major shifts in, you know, the areas of your life that govern yourself, your career, your home, or your relationships when there's an eclipse in those kinds of houses, especially if it's, you already have you know, your angles are associated with those particular signs of the Zodiac to begin with. So one of the things about 2024, it does seem, and we've talked a lot about Aries and the Aries energy, but there is a Libra component here. We have a lunar eclipse in Libra in March. And when we get to the fall, we have a solar Libra eclipse. And Libra is a lot about relationships, codependencies, and balances. And then we bring in these other archetypes of Aries and Pisces. But how would you, how do you perceive these two seasons in 2024? One we're stepping into the spring, I guess it's spring in our hemisphere. And then the ones that we're going to have later in this year. I see the spring part or the first part of the year, the March and April part, the Libra lunar eclipse and the Aries solar eclipse as clearing a bunch of stuff out and setting up new systems, patterns, paradigm, template, I don't know, mindset about what the individual is going to do. And then in the fall, we revisit and tinker with and set up new agreements for how relationships are going to go forward. So when we get to the Libra solar eclipse in October, we might be implementing a new way of going about things at that point or new relationships or things that fit where we're not operating by the same ground rules that we were last year or the years before. 
well, I am a traditional astrologer mostly. So I tend to look at the ruler of the eclipse to get a flavor for how, what kind of a mood is going to be in. And the, and the lunar eclipse in Libra in March, it's obviously both our eclipses are in Libra, so they're ruled by Venus. But the one in March, Venus is in Pisces. Venus likes to be in Pisces. She's happy there. She feels like she's gone to the luxury spa for a week by the ocean and has her feet up and being rubbed while someone plays her nice music. She's she's a happy camper. So it's a much gentler experience than the solar eclipse that is in October because the October eclipse, Venus has moved all the way around to Scorpio. You know, Scorpio is ruled by Mars and is super intense. And we all know that for people who have Scorpios in their lives. And Venus isn't always comfortable there. She likes things to be easy. She likes them to just come and bring me my stuff. But in when she's in a Mars ruled sign, she has to be a lot more demanding. This is what I want. And this is what I'm going to do to get it. And everyone else may have a hard time with that. She may be okay with totally asserting her dominance but it's not the most comfortable way to be. And so even though I would say that Aries eclipse is the most potent of the four and the, the March eclipse is the gentlest of the four, the ones in the fall are just, they're, they've got tons of aspects. The, the, the solar eclipse, none of the planets have any essential dignity, which basically is traditional astrology speak for, they all tend to be on their worst behavior. And- <laughs> ganging up like it's like we're all going to join the gang together and that that's not necessarily easy for for manifesting things in the world and because they both come with some very large what astrologers call grand trines where there are three planets in a close pattern with one another are harmonious they tend to manifest visible ways um so it, i think it's going to be I think it's going to be clearer in the spring. I think people are going to be, because we have that eclipse, Not it's around the same time we're going to be having Jupiter running across Uranus, which is going to have some of the same flavor for it. Jupiter is going to be moving into another sign. There's a lot of change going on within a month in that period of time that people are going to notice and people will have been preparing for. They're not going to be surprised when it comes. In the fall, it's going to be like, what am I doing? I had all these plans and now it's like, I was clear. I am not clear anymore. And yet things keep, you know, popping up that seem to be muddling up the story. That's how I think that they may be more like, likely to spin out in our world. And I, I, I can't imagine specifically what that's going to mean, only, only that given that Pluto is back in Capricorn, given that the, that eclipses in the, in the, in April are right across North America, given that those eclipse, that eclipse in, in, in those that Aries Libra is squaring off with the U.S. chart Sun and all of its planets in Cancer, I don't think it's going to be easy on us. I like how I like how we're kind of looking at it two different perspectives because I, I can see how that like there'll be parts of our lives that we are crystal clear. Like this has to leave. Like Kathy says, I, thank you for now that I know what I know. This is over, and I'm moving in that direction, and we can move into the fall with a little bit of confidence. But when we get to the fall, there's more to the story. There's a different way of seeing this. There, there's more to be revealed about what you need to know. But there's also like the, the universe likes to foreshadow a little bit too. As Donna said, during this first eclipse, you know, we have Jupiter talking to Uranus we, and, v, and Venus is happier, but we also have Mars and Saturn meeting in Pisces, which is not by any degree or, or de deacon close to where the eclipse is going to be in the fall, but it is a little bit of a holding pattern. I can almost see that you're trying to push forward with too many things at the same time. And you're going to feel like you're, the gas and the brake at the same time. But if you do your Saturn in the spring with whatever new, like if you clear it out and you're going forward, if you do your Saturn and you do it with a lot of courage, the Mars energy, then I think that's where you're going to see that a push forward in the fall when it comes to the Pisces area, but there still is a contender of what just happened. And I love the segue that you just gave us Donna about where the eclipse is happening. Cause this eclipse is going across the U S and if anyone follows astrology on Twitter or anywhere else, they like keep throwing up the beautiful eclipse map that has this huge X across Texas. So, and I even saw the other day, the weather channel was like, Texas is completely inundated, but now by tourists, people all trying to book to go and, and see this eclipse that we're about to have. Do you, and, I, and we all can look, think back to the last great American eclipse we had and how 
prior to that, prior to that eclipse, I think there's always been division in the world. That's just our nature, but that we weren't quite as divided before that eclipse went right, right across the U S and so there's some theories like, well, what does this mean? Now it's going the other way. Do you have any insight or thoughts that you want to talk about? I'll lead off with you, Donna, about the, the path of where this eclipse is going to be visible. Do you feel like that has more significance for the U S outside of the conversations it's having with the U.S.'s chart? Well, traditionally speaking, where the eclipse is does have some impact, especially if the countries that it's passing over mm -hmm. um, have planets that are actually tied up with said eclipse. You know, there's so many names for this one. You know, it's, when it's a named eclipse, everyone on the planet is going to be paying attention. <laughs> so oh, whether wow. you call it the second great American eclipse or the third great American eclipse or the great North American eclipse, you know, something on the order of 55 million people are going to be able to see at least part of it in North America. And there's 31 million in the actual path of totality. I'm one of them. Yay. And then there's another like 150 million who are within 90% of the totality. So that's an awful lot of people. And so the psychic impact of all of those people being able to see the same thing, I think that's where you get the generational imprints. I think oh. the people who went to school, like my daughter, I brought her to the 2017 eclipse. She remembers it. The second one, she went out and saw, uh, went to her uh, boyfriend's, their holiday place out in the, in the Texas Hill Country to see the second one. And she's probably going to go out there again. So she's in a generation where she grew up with three eclipses. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, that won't ever happen again in, wow. in, in, in our lifetimes for, for certain. And I don't think the next major eclipse in the United States is for a very long time. So what do you get when you have a generation that's grown up under eclipses? That is an excellent question. I guess we will have to see what time will bring in their change agency, so to speak. I, so there's that, there's that the psychic impact that it has over the people who are watching it. I don't, I can't think of any kind of phenomenon that's quite like watching a total solar eclipse. It's just, it's eerie, it's odd, and you don't forget. Um, so there's that level. And then there's the more how it's tied up with the psyche of a nation. Uh, eclipses bring change because they make us deal with our shadow stuff that's like bubbling up from the deep recesses of our unconscious. And since the last eclipse in 2017, the United States has been going through its Pluto return. So we can't completely divorce that muckraking process of where all of our prejudices and intolerances because they're being thrown in our face from day to day and not wanting and the issue of not wanting to see where we are intolerant or not wanting to take ownership and how can we how can we like burn the books so that we don't actually have to look at those things you know that's playing out in spades and given that the united states is having its next election when pluto has gone backwards into capricorn we're not done we're just not finished and we are moving into Pisces Virgo eclipses starting next year. Like this one only has one. Next year has three Pisces Virgo eclipses and only one Aries eclipse. And then the following year will be, you know, deeper into that cycle. And so even though there's a lot of breaking things down this year, I think it's just in preparation for something bigger, you know, because when Uranus... Saturn and Neptune are all switching signs next year. A lot. Astrologers are going to be crazy. That's that's just a lot of movement all at once. And Saturn and Neptune are moving into areas where these eclipses have just happened. So that's part of why they're clearing the way for what's coming next. Because as Saturn and, and Neptune, move, they're also going right across the world axis. And Neptune dissolves everything. And takes away the rules and Saturn comes around behind it, tries to make new rules or new structures. And they're coming at the same time. And put Uranus in, in Gemini after it spent the last seven years in Taurus. Taurus is tame and calm and grounded compared to Gemini. I mean, Uranus is going to feel like, you know, the roaring 20s have finally arrived. And so I... I I say, let go of, you know, would you rather have, would you rather make your own changes with some agency in the process? Or would you rather be, you know, dragged behind the bus as it's changing everything? I mean, change can come in many ways. 
<laughs> you have a choice here. If you feel it, then do what you need to do. You know, you've been given like lots of space over the last couple of years to do something that's more in alignment with what feels right for you, given what the world is bringing. I mean, heck, I, you're, I'm sitting here in my parents' basement because I, I put all of my stuff in a pod and moved across the country. I don't have a place to live yet. And some of that's because I'm, I'm kind of waiting, not just for the markets to get themselves sorted out a little bit, but I needed time to figure out what I needed for me so that when I do get in a place, I know it's right for where I need to be next. And I know I'm not the only one in the midst of these kinds of, whether it's affecting your job or your relationships, you want to be in a place that's going to be supportive of you when the crazy stuff comes. That was a very long-winded answer. That's a good answer though. I liked it a lot. I think it's, yeah, I think it is important. And that's one of the hardest things is when we're going through changes is that we try to hold on to something that's comfortable to us. But I like that you, you've said it more than once in this podcast, making way for something better, but the chaos between what, between where we are and what better may be is unseen. It's a long bridge to walk across before you burn it behind you because you don't know what you're walking toward. <laughs> Let me put it into context for anybody who's had to move. And since it's fresh in my mind, it's easy to say, you know, the last six months where I had to like live in a house where I was putting everything into boxes and they kept getting higher and higher and I'm walking across my house, tripping over them was really not a lot of fun. <laughs> it was not a lot of fun at all, but I knew I needed to do it to end up someplace that was better in the long run for me on multiple levels. I think Saturn is really the, un, the like the mystery support character for all of these eclipses because he's in there somewhere doing yeah. something. You know, he's like with the eclipse ruler in that first eclipse. He's like over there with the eclipse ruler in the second eclipse. And he's, and you know, he's across uh, with the uh, Pisces eclipse. He's like, right across from Mercury, who's the eclipse ruler. So he's like making a direct aspect with the eclipse ruler almost every single time. And Saturn is the, you need to grow up. You need yeah. to be an adult. You know, Kathy calls it what? The adulting planet? Planet of adulting. Yeah. It's put I your big it, pants on. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, it's also the planet that has to do with delayed gratification. So you yeah. may not like some of the results for what's happening now or may not be your favorite thing, but in context, you know, you realize you're doing it for a larger purpose. And I think you can get through a lot of stuff if you realize there's a bigger reason for it. Yes. Yeah. And that delayed gratification that, that I've seen that come up a lot because that's something that this generation is, is it's hard when and I, I'm a victim of it. I have a, I want it now. You know what I mean? Like I want to click it and I want to get it now. I don't want to wait for it, but there's a delayed gratification. And I think that you, one of the ways that I connect back into it, especially as we step into the spring is gardening, like knowing I have to, like I planted them on, on the new moon. And now what, what, what does it look like on the full moon and, and how do I keep going? And then like, when I start to see those results, I automatically want to go plant more seeds, but I, but I don't need to be planting them at that time of the month. I have to wait. So the delayed gratification is a good thought to walk with for everyone who's listening today, because that's something that our environment doesn't have us do right now. We, we push a button and we get what we want, but knowing that we have to put in the work and work with the flow and the season of time is definitely um, a good best practice to walk with. Kathy, do you have any comments about the trajectory or the path of where we're going to see this, how it may impact the U S or people who are witnessing this? I think that there's a, a, a tremendous collective psychic impact of recognizing on a non-rational level that humans do not control everything. This mm -hmm. there is something utterly untamed and uncontrollable about uncontrollable about watching an eclipse, particularly if you watch it with other people, because your brain is getting a message. Humans don't steer this. You mm -hmm. just have to wait it out. And I think that has an enormous effect, ultimately, just going through it. Now, what it's going to do with the U.S. I I have not formulated thoughts about that yet. Yeah, I'm kind of staying curious too. I remember with the last quote unquote Great American Eclipse, I was on our farm, and so just witnessing 
the way that nature reacted mm -hmm. to the eclipse was breathtaking because I mean, these, these are thoroughbred horses. There's, there's other disciplines as well. Not only how still they came as the gradual darkness came, but just the, the, the pond, everything around us, the whole earth, like it was a shutdown. So yeah, it, it is a very powerful energy. And I'm interested to see how the invitation, the psychic invitation is received and what we choose to do with it. If we choose to see that we all are one and there is something bigger than us. And how can we step forward into this, let go of things that are unhealthy and reach for something that's more karmically aligned for us as a, not as only as individuals, but as a humanity to, to move forward, because sometimes it's easier to descent, to stand beside our fights, our opinion, our, or not notice that we're triggered by something instead of being curious about the conflict. Well, why does this bother me? Or why do I feel the way that I do about this situation? Because we don't really have a lot of space in our days right now to contemplate. Those of us who make space are far ahead of the game, but making space to contemplate and to think and to consider is not something that, at least in my world, I'm sure maybe you ladies have a different world. I mean, I have a lot of teenagers around me. This <laughs> is It's go, go, go. <laughs> but yeah, I think that I'm interested to see how that works overall. Okay, so Kathy, do you have any comments about some of the things that Donna mentioned, especially with the Pisces eclipse and changes coming in for the next year? Well, one opportunity that we have, and that's, could you hear the quotes around that word? <laughs> This fall, when we have our first eclipse in the Pisces Virgo family for this round, it will be a lunar eclipse at the end of September with Neptune very close by. And since lunar eclipses wrap some things up, bring revelations, and it's going to be about the interconnectedness of all life, and with Neptune being there, who knows what how we fooled ourselves or being highly romanticized or we're all going to like dress like Stevie Nicks or I don't know what will happen. But you can look at this as of the first big wrap-up event for Neptune's time in Pisces before it moves into Aries next year. So this is the beginning of finishing up what the Neptune in Pisces transit has meant for each of us individually. And since Pisces and, well, Neptune just brings, you know, clouds. If you've had Neptune transit, a, a, a planet in your chart, people have suddenly <laughs> wondered what happened to your brain. Perhaps you have. I, anyway, I have tales. <laughs> I do too. I do too. <laughs> Things that I did and, and just completely, completely spaced out about but there is a like a dissolving of conscious control, a dissolving of boundaries, a dissolving of of sense, I guess. I don't know. The difference between dimensions, heaven and earth, whatever. So this fall, whatever starts to be revealed to you or whatever, you're, you could be a highly creative time, but just know that the first blush of all this while we're rewriting how we interact with each other will be to start to finish up what Neptune's time in Pisces has meant to each of us. And that's a long transit, 12 years, 14 years, Donna, how long has it Started been? in 2011. So <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. The ruler of that eclipse is Jupiter and it's in Gemini, at what astrologers call the bendings, like the halfway point between the sun and the moon. And um, one of the things Jupiter likes to do is prophesy and reveal the truth. And so it's an interesting push and pull between the fantasy and truth. And it, but since Gemini's in Jupiter's in Gemini, there's a lot of jizz in that one. It's going to take a while to get used to Jupiter's yeah. in Gemini. Gemini sees truth as a multifaceted thing. It doesn't see that there is one truth. It just sees many and lots of people who like, you know, the zealot, the zealot types, the true believers don't like the idea that multiple truths are possible. And so it's, it's complex. It's complex and crazy. And that's why I think it's going to be so hard to, especially, you know, we are seven months out, lots of things can happen between now and then that I, I just, I think that we are going to be very surprised by where we end up and maybe not surprised at all. Can you do that? Can you be both at the same time? Yeah, I, I definitely, I do that all the time. <laughs> it's just sort of like, a Gemini, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
but a lot of us are detached from listening to our intuition or anticipating. Like I, I, we may say, I knew that was going to happen like in a bad way. Like I knew that was going to happen, but there's a lot of things like I was, I I thought that was going to happen, but wow, that happened once it comes across to the other side. I think it's also important as we get into, as we move through these eclipses is to, to really pay attention to the diet that you give yourself as far as what information you allow in and out, especially as we start approaching, you know, Jupiter and Gemini and, and multiple truths, et cetera, that it could get very overwhelmed. And in, in the fall, we have Mars going retrograde after the outside of this topic or whatever, but there's, there's always more than one thing happening in the chart, but it very much is a release and reach kind of energy. You have to let go of something and reach for something that you can't anticipate on one level. But I love how you guys brought in Neptune and closing up that chapter. And I'm I can't wait to start. We'll have to have a whole other podcast about Neptune leaving and, and Uranus and Gemini. And I, I, I can bring Saturn into this conversation. All right. All right. That all right. Is, let's just let everyone know in case you haven't had this drilled into your head. Before we get to the Pisces lunar eclipse, Jupiter in Gemini and Saturn in Pisces are going to be square in August. They're going to do it again on Christmas. Eve, but this is the first one and that's going to put some structure some constraints some containment some whoa nelly on uh the multiple storylines flying around i think uh, we can hope yeah there's a potential for it okay that could rein in some of the jupiterian excess uh before we even get to the eclipse that jupiter in traditional astrology rules and as I said, Saturn is lurking in the background of all of these eclipses. I mean, he can bring, you know, sense, restraint, some kind of boundaries. <laughs> and it's something to keep things from going completely off the rails. I mean, it's also the year where 2024, 2025 is the height of the major lunar standstill. So every time the moon is in Gemini or Cancer or Sagittarius or Capricorn, it's going to be out of bounds. So out of bounds moons, that's like four out of every 12 zodiac signs. <laughs> so that's a that's a third. <laughs> a third of the time the moon is out of bounds. And when that happens, you know, talk about the cycles that was happening what when the berlin wall fell and the iron curtain came down that was happening in the summer of love <laughs> that was happening many of these same times that we've just talked about before so there's other things going on in the sky that make this a very let's break the old pattern and come up with a new one and people were talking about that at the end of the 2020s but i think we're like we're really in it now yeah. like like the decisions that we've made now are like this is fish or cut bait time, you know? I have heard that theme come up through this this talk a lot too today. It's like we go really far and then we retract back. So do you feel like we are getting ready to go really far outside of bounds? Are we are about to retract back the bounds that we have gone outside of? How do, where do you feel like we are in the story now, the collective? They're going to break. They're going to break? The bounds are going to break? I think the balance is going to break and we're going to have to build something new. Completely. Okay. And then, and then the cycle will like reassert itself because anytime you make major changes, there's always a backlash, but I think we're on a breaking point right now that yeah, is going yeah. to mess with everybody's. We're going to go into like emergency mode, not, not business as usual mode. I don't mean to be like fear oriented. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I think, I think we're going to break down before we have our breakthrough. I mean, I mean that there's things in the external environment that we have created for ourselves that are just perfect for sticking to these things. Yeah. You know, that, that global warming or climate change is happening faster than they predicted. The water is going to roll into places and not roll out. And, you know, the storms are getting worse. I mean, we didn't have a winter here. I mean, yes, we had a couple storms, but it's 70 degrees tomorrow. It's, it's freaking barely March. And so that's not normal. And at some point in time, we are going to deal with the consequences of these things in ways that we, we've we talked about. They've been theoretical constructs that we might've seen in movies, but we, we are hitting the point where 
you know, things are going to get real and we're going to have to make some changes. And I don't know exactly what that's going to look like because a lot of it's going to deter be determined by, you know, a large portion of the planet is having elections this year, you know, elections in quotes, because, you know, we have various degrees of free elections around the world, but, yeah. you know, something like a third of the planet is electing a new leader and what all those people decide is going to have something to do with how we can respond or not. So rather than put people in fear, I always want to encourage people to, you know, if you're grounded, if you're, I, when I was in high school, I was on a cliff rescue program. So basically that meant we pretended that our fellow students got stuck in a tree or down on the side of a cliff and we had to rescue them so that we could take them to the hospital. And you learn after a couple of years of this, that the response to crisis is not the sky is falling, the sky is falling. The response to crisis is to calm down, sit, look around, see what you have, decide what's the most important thing to work on and do with that next. So it's it's very Saturnine. It's ground yourself and keep it as simple as possible. And given that we're gonna have all kinds of issues that are gonna test people in ways they probably haven't imagined yet, whether it's because you know, AI has changed everything. We have more outages because someone hacked the system. <laughs> we have droughts, we have floods, we have fires, we have all of those things. People are going to have to learn how to adapt, even in situations that aren't always easy. And to do that, we need to be clear, do our time meditating, recognize what's important to us. Don't have as much stuff. Keep it as simple as you can so that you have the flexibility for dealing with whatever comes. You know, you might know it's crazy, but you don't have to go into fear to approach it. You know, we all go through transitions in our lives that we know about. If you get pregnant, you know you're going to have a baby. <laughs> if you go to college, you really hope you're going to graduate. And those are big changes that are coming up. But you don't, like, you don't go into fear. At least most people don't. They just, they go to class and learn Lamaze or something. And so that's where we are right now. It's like, take the skills that you need that are going to be beneficial wherever we're going next. Said, well said. I like how you brought into the, the weather aspect of eclipses, because I think we often think about them as like, well, what's going to happen to my life? What is this going to happen for the politics and the money and stuff? But the but they do have some weather patterns that come in with them as well, too. Because I think a lot of times when people think about eclipses or they think about these kind of like overarching years, they're looking at politics, they're looking at finances. That's in the news a lot right now. We're also looking at how we are as a collective, how we're divided, how we can come back together. And then we're trying to pull this down into our personal lives because inevitably it does impact our lives. When big companies make decisions, it impacts you on some level or another, whether you're employed or you're a consumer and whoever we elect across the world, that's going to have an impact on some level too. So I think we've come up with some really great points. I love how Donna said, what's important to you? Why is it important to you? What is? What are you going to do? What's your short term? What's your long term? How can you be reflective right now so you know where you would go and something that i think is also important too though your what's valuable to you can change knowing you have to at least know what that is in the, in the interim like you know this is important to me right now like this is why this is important to me and then also asking yourself if it's important to your soul or if it's important to your ego because if we have saturn in play here and we're working with eclipses we're really talking about a karmic energy and you know, Saturn karma never forgets an address. So there's, there's going to be a cycle. That comes back. <laughs> oh, I like that one. Yeah, it's gonna, it's one of those things like, oh, wow. And, and I think a lot of times I'll see, you know, whether it's personally or working with people that often we don't understand, like we think, oh, well, it's karma. Like, like if I do something to Kathy, then I'm away for Kathy to boomerang back. But if Kathy doesn't do it, then the karma is not there. But it's a situation where like, maybe you were the person that was just looking at the numbers on the spreadsheet. And you're like, you know what, we have to make these cuts. And you send out an a message saying, make these cuts, not thinking about the people on the other side, but then on the other side of your life, then someone in your life that you really care about, or maybe even your own household is receiving a message from their company. It's a, it's a karmic cycle and it's to teach you. And, and, and a lot of times people say, well, I had, I had no other choice, but it's really stepping outside of who you are, looking at the story that you are in. What's important to you? Why is it important to you? Is it going to matter in five years? And what is it going to matter for, for the next generation? I mean, my grandparents 
and their grandparents always, they all were always thinking about the next generation, what they were leaving, what legacy, it was a very legacy bound Saturnian kind of energy. And we've gotten a little bit detached from that right now, but I think that it sounds like there's an awakening. There's a divergent path ahead of us that we're being invited to step into as a collective and as an individual. And in the midst of it, it could feel overwhelming for sure, but trusting and knowing your values and where you're going, is going to be a valuable tool through both of these eclipse seasons. And I think they're, they're going to build into each other. It's a story. A lot of times people are like, well, the, the March 25th came and nothing happened. I'm free and clear. But a lot of times you hear these eclipse, you feel them you definitely before and after, and sometimes they merge and they meet, or you feel as if you kind of dodged a bullet in the spring. Like I didn't have to clear out anything. I wasn't activated. I don't know what they were talking about. And then on the fall, everything that you kind of pushed down and pretended wasn't there swells back up and and you're contending with it all at the same time. So I think paying attention to those nuances too would be very helpful in this. Don't just stop delivering when the eclipse is over. Um, oh, no. They make the <laughs> degrees that they happen at like very potent for some number of some people would say months, some people would say years. Afterwards, the longer they're activated longer, the longer the eclipse occurs. So like really long eclipses tend to like hang out a longer time. So these eclipses, you read the degrees before, Jamie. I think it's at, we have five degrees Libra. Yes. Uh, we have 10 degrees Libra. We have 19 degrees Aries, right? Yes. And 25 degrees Pisces. Yeah. So those degrees are going to become very sensitive when things go across them again. And well, you know, given that, that we've already talked about Neptune and Neptune and Saturn moving into Aries, it won't be that long until a lot of those eclipse degrees are impacted by those two planets. So, yeah. and, and all the other planets move a lot faster. So every time the moon hits one of those eclipse points, there's the potential for continuing the story, at least for a little while. I have two dates in particular I'd like to alert people to. Ooh, alert, write it down. Because I, all right, because I like to pay attention to whenever Mars has a hard aspect to an eclipse degree because it sets off celestial clockwork. It's a timer. All right, the I'm going to I'm going to do them in reverse order. I'm, the eclipses are going to be activated in reverse order of their occurrence. The 19 Aries solar eclipse from uh, April 8th, Mars will hit that degree of Aries May 29. So there could be something at the end of May, right when Jupiter has changed signs, that suddenly goes oh shoot in the, like <laughs> like you know the lever goes click. And now there's something big, big, big happening yeah. that you can look back and go, oh, yeah, that's a tide in the mat. Then the lunar eclipse on March 25th at 5 Libra, Mars in Cancer in September of this year will square that. So that's another, oops, something's got to go, bam, and Mars in Cancer Mars isn't particularly happy in Cancer. I like to think of, you know, army boots in the kitchen. Mars in Cancer fights for its home turf and can be really pissy, but fighting for something that it it loves or that it thinks it needs to protect. So there could be some turf war. Anyway, just note, note that right before we get to the, right around the time of the Neptune enhanced Pisces, lunar eclipse we've got activation of the springs lunar eclipse before we get to the reset of the solar eclipse in libra was that too confusing no it's right on i'm writing the dates down like crazy yes yeah, so those are awesome dates do you have any dates or insights you want to add to that miss donna you know, i'm still getting over the fact that mars is i mean mercury is going retrograde on my birthday <laughs> oh god Oh dear. I know you're such a beautiful Mercury person. You'll be able to make the best of that. <laughs> you're fine with a little bit of Honestly, if I really want to know when, when trigger dates are happening, I'll call Kathy. <laughs> yeah. I'm not too proud to admit that. Oh, oh that's thank you. Trigger. That's the trigger. Yeah. Well, Mars and Saturn activate things yeah. and, and Mars is what's going to be 
plowing through now like what yeah and, and look at it like it's a it's a, a lever that's been poised 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 and then it just moves <laughs> cartoon look at it like a cartoon yeah astrology this is why i think that's the reason i'm so addicted to it or in this field i love the foreshadowing but i also like the 20 you know what are the hindsight's 2020 i like that version too but i also know the sense the universe has a sense of humor and likes to prove me wrong more than right about certain situations <laughs> our our shows you a different angle which i think is interesting like the way that you spoke about jupiter going into gemini will be like that's true but then that's true too so perspective plays into it and when we're talking about these big shifts, I think it's also important, like when you dial into your values is to appreciate what you have. Cause sometimes we, we focus on what, wow, wow, I want to go get this, 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 and this, or this should be right. We don't appreciate what we have till it's gone. So that's another thing that I think is important when you have trigger dates or when you have eclipse dates to say, okay, this change is coming and I, I need to know. And sometimes you're the person initiating the change. Sometimes yeah. you're the one who says I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm done. This, this is the day that this has to end. And sometimes you're receiving it, but either way, you know, like I, I counsel a lot of people that are, I need to get out of this job, but giving yourself a goal, especially knowing some of the dates that we've talked about today and saying, you know what, by October or November of 2024, I'm not going to be at this job. I'm going to be whatever. And if you don't have a single plan, just knowing that you have that goal to be out of that situation, that relationship, that job, or to have a new idea at least gives you the freedom to appreciate where you are and make an exit plan where you feel at least like you're co-creating some with eclipses. I would venture to say you don't have a lot of power, but intention helps and intention helps, you know, which way to pivot, I guess would be my feedback. Do you agree with that? Or would you think it's a time to be receptive? Traditionally, you wouldn't do magic to manifest things during eclipses. Simply yep. because the lights that manifest things, the vi the vital lights of the sky are not shining or at least not shining well i mean so i i personally for my dream i personally wouldn't stand out there and under the eclipse and go bring it i need change because that's oh just a little harsh for no, me. Well, that's be careful what you ask for oh, <laughs> yeah. oh my god nope nope mm -mm. but i the flip side of what you're saying you know i think it's good to have intentions but i also think it's it's good to recognize that fear usually doesn't get us anywhere i mean no. it's a biological imperative to be afraid so that we run away from the saber-toothed tigers but since there's really no saber-toothed tigers running around most of the time the fear and anxiety that we create for ourselves are not they're not giving us constructive helpful useful things for the way we live our lives. They make us, it makes us neurotic and it makes us less able to be in our present. I mean, fear is always a projection for the future or, you know, it's corollary of depression being clinging on to the past. And neither of us, oh, those are places from which we can operate. We can only operate from the present. And so being present, being grounded that's the good way to use Saturn, not the using it to make yourself terrified. I mean, that's why I love the myth of Saturn, you know, that Kronos was fine, you know, having his kids until someone came along and said one of his kids was going to overthrow him. And so he ate his children because he figured that I guess they wouldn't overthrow him if they were in his stomach. And, you know, his wife and his, and his mother were like done with this. And so they hid one of the kids who of course came back to overthrow Saturn <laughs> and banish him. So, I mean, the point being, you gotta ask yourself the question, if if the freaking psychic hadn't told him that he was gonna have a problem, would any of it happened? Because he would have had nothing to be afraid of. Um, so sometimes our fear creates our self-fulfilling prophecies. And we need to be really careful with that, especially if you are new age minded and you are, hear yourself saying things or are surrounded by people who are saying things like that. Things manifest much faster these days. Well, mm. don't put your fear out there if you want to keep that at least to a minimum or at least recognize that, as you both said, more times than once, you can't control everything. So being terrified is only making you suffer and it's not helping your ability to cope with what's coming 
I think if you look back on your own life, you will recognize that even when bad things have happened, you have found a way to get through them. And, and this is why Saturn gets better when we get older, because things aren't new. It's like, oh, I did that before. I can do it again. And, and you, you just you panic less. So those who panic less are going to do better over the next couple of years because you're going to have more of your resources to act, act consciously rather than react out of a, an old script that you're playing. Would you like to add anything to that, Miss Kathy? Ms. Donna said. What I would say is if you cling, the harder you cling, sometimes the harder the cosmic two by four comes down on your hand. Yep. So if it's something really, if you're really being uh, escorted out of a situation, you can't make yourself stay. You just can't. I have many stories of things yeah. in my own life from this, like, oh my God. So. Yeah. I, I think there's a very big difference between believing in something you feel called to do that that keeps you calm and centered gives you direction and holding on to something out of fear of the alternatives and if there's fear in that that's when it becomes and i think we all know the difference like internally i can think of times when i'm like i'm not giving this up i'm not giving this up no 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 no, no. that's different than i see this thing it resonates in my heart that's where i need to go and we need more of the heart resonating North stars and less of the, I, I, I have to have this stuff to feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty powerful. And I think that I've seen so many different ways that people have used eclipses and some of them are like, I, I, I'm charging in, I'm taking my power back. And sometimes you need that gumption. Some people who don't normally do that, they need the gumption to say I'm done. And there's sometimes if you, you already have a lot of gumption, then maybe that's not the right thing. Just, it, just to, to keep in mind that it's karmic. It's all circular. It's coming back around and there's a lesson there to be learned. There is an excellent point. If you feel you need the karma of a kick in the ass to get you moving, <laughs> go stand out there and say, bring it when there's an eclipse. And I promise yeah. you, you might like ignite a flood of changes in your life. Yeah. <laughs> so Things that you would never, never imagine. Energy. Yeah. I have a vast imagination and, and the universe outwits my imagination every, every time. So as far as the things that could go and not, not always negative. I think there for one, one eclipse cycle, I had been looking for a place speaking to Donna's moving. I had been looking for a place to move for a long time and had done everything I could to kind of push against that current. And out of nowhere, a place showed up in a Facebook marketplace that had never existed. And within 30 days I was living there. And I mean, it was, it didn't exist, was there right place, right time. Eclipses can bring a lot of positive things into your life. It is a karmic fast forward button positive. And karma is not necessarily positive or negative. It's it's karma. It's like it's coming back around. It's a realigning you. There's a lot of big changes that maybe you felt like you've been swimming against the current or you've been paying your dues for a long time. And along with some of the other transits that we have happening in the sky, there are some big shifts. But even when you make that shift, when you make that leaf, that kind of comes into Saturn and Pisces. You have to have faith. You have to believe in something that you can't see. And you have to do the due diligence and trust that you're going to get to the other side though it's not all laid out and there's not a, a security plan or, you know, an, an automatic refund on your, on your gesture towards a new life. You have to, to learn as you go with this energy, but it's definitely going to be a powerful time. This is more about being, I would grounded in who you are receptive of where you're going, understand that what you put out is coming back and that the changes are going to take you probably outside the bounds of your imagination. We're definitely building to something that we can't see collectively more so personally, because you're going to respond to the collective things on a personal level too. Are there any other insights or keywords or key dates that either of you would like to leave the audience with? Out of my way. Uh, Honestly, I'm seeing people having hit the end, like, nope, nope, nope. So there's going to be a brusqueness and an unapologetic nope to yeah. it. Especially in the spring. Oh, yeah. 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 Someone asked me for a, to look at something very, very involved recently and someone I've known for a long time and, and, and I sent my response and what I got back was, tell it to the hand and an wow. Alvin and the Chipmunk song. And my reaction was, and the hand is waving goodbye. <laughs>
Don't, so don't second guess. You'll have an, you know, if you have an immediate reaction to something, do not talk yourself out of it. I think for some signs that's harder, some natural tendencies in your chart are more agreeable. And that's when this energy really takes you off guard. And some of them are like, yep, that's my diet. Can I have a double dose of Mars, please? I'll tell you how to use it. Or let me, <laughs> please follow my mojo here. But yeah, I like that out of my way. All right, Miss Donna, do you have any closing thoughts? I think it's going to be, I think next year is going to be huge. I think okay. whatever you clean out this year is going to be good for you. And and panicking is not necessary. Don't panic. So I sound like a Douglas Adams book. We're um, going to get tea and no tea this year at the same time. That's a Douglas Adams goodness. concept too. I interrupted you. I apologize. No, I. it is a very paradoxical <laughs> year, especially in the fall. If you're expecting, I mean, you, and that's okay. I would leave you with that. If you have clarity and purpose and direction, and you've started a new life for yourself in the spring, don't be surprised if fall comes around and you like, you know, realize, okay, that's not what I intended, or that's not what I had in mind. This is more than I expected or not what I expected. Or, or in my case, if I buy a house, like three weeks from now, and I'm so happy and I move in and I get to the fall and I realize that the roof needs to be replaced because right. it's leaking after I start living in the house, something, maybe not that if you're not in that scenario, but there is a, this is not entirely what I expected. So again, it's okay to change directions. You know, yeah. sometimes I think people get stuck on the, if what I want is not manifesting, I have to keep trying by banging my head against the wall. And sometimes that's the universe's Ooh. way of saying, um, maybe you're not entirely manifesting the right thing, or maybe you're not doing it in the right way because you're missing the lesson here if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, yeah. we need it. People say they want to evolve. I'm evolving. You know what that means? That means I'm changing. So I don't understand why people can be so attached to the, I don't want to change, but I want to evolve. Because that just strikes me as. Yeah, we, we want to a la carte it. We want to pick and say, I'm keeping that. I'm letting that go. And sometimes it, it's, there's more to the story with that too. There's a, re there's a reason behind it all. And that's also something very important to keep in mind. Like Donna's mentioned a couple of times, like you're going to make some great leap forward decisions in the spring and in the fall, you're going to get a different side of the story. We are, we are having such a paradigm change shifting moment by 2026. We will have gone from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. All of them were in earth signs. And by 2026, they're all in air and fire, earth and water signs, and then they'll be air and fire signs. That's everything is different. So yeah. it's not a failure of imagination. If we're in something that is so new, we can't even visualize exactly what it is yet, which yeah. is not entirely out of the blue of a suggestion given that between the twin pillars of climate change and technology technological revolutions that are being sped up by the introduction of ai these are two world shaping changing shattering things that are happening simultaneously and how they interact we can't possibly know because we've never gone through it before so of course we can't guess where we're going to end up i mean people will end up doing jobs that aren't even invented yet yes. so it's okay to say, I don't know yet. Yeah, I yeah. know what's important to me. Here's my general direction. But beyond that, be willing to adapt and shift. And and the, the more positive an attitude you maintain, the more likely you are going to attract things that are more positive because that is just how our brains work. Mm -hmm. So do it that way. You may end up in some place you didn't entirely suspect, but it might be fine and it might be lovely and it might be better than you ever imagined. But the next couple of years, you can't expect them to be sedentary. You can't expect things to be stationary because the, you know, people, people last year started freaking out about, you know, Pluto moving into Aquarius, right? We had a little bit of a taste in the middle of the year. Next year is our taste year for three planets moving, not one, three until they all finally get there and stay there in 2026. So how do you counsel people to just, you know, chill? <laughs> so how many times do you say, please meditate. It will be helpful. Yeah. Please re get rid of your junk. I've been, we've been saying these things since like 20, what, 15? When all the squares were happening. 
And and then we had a pandemic and people got locked in their houses and had plenty of time to clean them out. But did they? I don't know. So really, things are going to be like, the different is coming for real. It's a good title. The different is coming for real. Eclipses in 2024. <laughs> I like it a lot. I think that's all great points. And it's all something that we could lean into. And, I, and I, stuff that I found myself saying recently, I remember when I was in college, I, there's no way that I could have signed up for what I do every day right now. It wasn't in the ah. college. <laughs> 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 so, it did, it did not exist. And yeah, so I like, I think there's a lot of things just around the corner and it is important I'm very much about manifestation and, and understanding your personal way of manifesting. So if you're like, I can't sit there and not think then maybe you need to walk and not think, or maybe you need to kickbox and not think, figure out how you can connect and like clear out your mind, clear out the clutter and, you know, all best practices, because it does come down to self-care. It does come down to knowing thyself, understanding what's important to the soul, what feeds your soul, where you're going, the karmic pattern, because you're here right now for a reason. And it's probably not just to witness it. We don't, we don't need, we need all, you're the starring role in a story, you know, that we're all woven into right now. So it's important to to note that and, and understand that you're on purpose and you're on time and you're going to be just fine. You're going to be fine in the story where, where you end up at. I, I, Kathy, Donna, I want to thank you both so much for being here on scheduling fate. This has been a treat for me. I love listening to the wisdom of both of you all the time and to ensure that this audience gets to witness that that's great too. I'm going to make sure that underneath this broadcast, you can find some great links to connect with these wonderful wise women to get more insights, not only through this eclipse season, but of course, all those big stories that we were already mentioning. And I'd love to have you both back to talk about some of these other epic changes that we have in the future too. Always. Thank you very much. This was fun. We love Aww. you, Jamie. Yeah. This is awesome. God, and I love to talk to each other. <laughs> we just talk each- when no one else is around. So. <laughs> That's how, you know, it's all natural and it feels like, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. Like we're sitting around having a cup of coffee with some girls and I'm, I'm, this is how it is, but it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to have you back. Please be sure to look underneath this broadcast for how you connect, connect with these brilliant ladies and with me, and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone.